I need your prayers. It was the late Dietrich Baumhofer, who was the German theologian who quoted in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, that the badge or the true badge of Christianity is suffering. And that suffering is a part of the Christian economy. It is a part of the matrix of life. He draws his conclusion basically from New Testament scripture, mainly Jesus says, Luke 9, 23, that if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily. Have I got any Bible readers in here? And follow me. The problem with 21st century Christianity is much of what we see in the media is presented and packaged as a Christ or a crossless faith. It's not a cross you pursue, but much, much of what we hear is prosperity to pursue. I mean, we hear get rich and die trying in the club, and then we come to church and hear get rich and die trying from the church. And so therefore, Christians now think that to suffer is to be out of God's will. But can I get a witness here that can testify that sometime you could be in the middle of God's will and you still... Anybody know what I'm talking about? The truth is suffering is a part of life, it's a part of the Christian economy. We don't determine our cross because if we determine our cross, we would determine the size of our cross. Give me that small one right there. But God determines the size of the cross. It's only human. It's only human and not indeed too far removed to wonder if at times anyone else goes through what we're going through. When you find yourself going through the storms of life, when you find yourself in a alley that's too small to turn around in or, or dead end street and you wonder God why me and if you're not careful you'll find yourself falling into what I call the why me syndrome and the why me syndrome is simply when when you are handed a cross that you don't want to bear and you begin to send light, see life through the lenses of isolation through the lens of paralyzation and through the lenses of victimization. Preach O.T. Moses. I'm doing the best I can. Play that tune one more time. The victim or the why me syndrome is when you've been handed a cross that you don't want to bear and you begin to see life through the lenses of isolation, through the lenses of vi isolation, victimization and paralyzation. Is there anybody here know what I'm talking about? Well, if you ever walk down that street if you've ever rolled down that bus, then Peter gives us some nuggets to help us today. Peter is the author of this epistle, which is different from the writings of Paul. Paul writes letters to the churches, but Peter writes a general epistle to Christians. He, he writes it to people that are trying to hold on to hope while hell is on their back. They're suffering. They're going through a difficult time. They're going through the storm and the rain. His audience are first century Christians who are suffering persecution simply because of the name of Christ. They're living in a mad world because they are, they are being governed by a mad man. This text was written during the time when, when Nero was on was in, in control. Nero was a mad man. Nero, he was a mad man. And, 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 and during this time, which was called the Great Fires of Rome, it is recorded by Tacitus, the, the, the Jewish historian, and Josephus, that all along the five and a half days that, 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 that Rome burned, that Nero played his fiddle. And it was recorded by some that there was no appeasement or suspicion that no doubt Nero set the fire himself. Because Nero wanted to rebuild Rome, regain fame, and he wanted to pick out a scapegoat to accuse for the fire that burned down Rome. And who better to accuse than these new Christians? 
those who were going around that were articulating on the first of that Friday he died. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and on Sunday morning he rose with all power in his hands. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I'm looking for your address. All fear is gone. And life is worth the living. Because he Because he lives. Nero made scapegoats out of Christians. He dressed them in animal skins, put them in arenas, allowed wild dogs and animals to tear at them. Nero dipped them in wax and killed them and put them in wax and lined them up on his on the front of his house as candles to be lit at nighttime. Christians were being tortured. Christians were being persecuted. And you, you think you got it bad. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We, we, we think, we think, and I wonder if anyone was to accuse you of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence? Don't put your head down, make you look guilty. To find you guilty? If your life was at stake, would you be willing, preach your team Moses? Give your life for the sake of Christ. It was, it was under those conditions that Peter is writing this book. And, and so in chapter number four, he paints the Christian as a soldier. That's preparing for war. He, he presents himself, Peter, the apostle of the Lord, Jesus Christ. And he tells them that because Jesus suffered and came out in victory, that we should be like-minded and to suffer with Christ. As Paul says in Philippians 3.10, that I might know him in the fellowship of his suffering and in the power of his resurrection. That in my suffering, I realize that my undeserved suffering is redemptive. And that although I'm going through the storm and the rain, and so he says, therefore, as you're going through the suffering, as you're going through persecution, don't stop loving people. Don't stop loving one another. Don't stop giving to the poor. Don't stop taking care of those who are disenfranchised. Even though you're going through, don't stop carrying out your Christian responsibility by loving your neighbor. And maybe I ought to stop right here and put a quarter in the meeting and say, I know somebody is suffering in here, but that does not give you a reason to be mean as a bag of rattlesnakes and, and not care for somebody. When you're going through the storms of rain, that's when your light needs to shine the most. Yes, yes sir. Come here. Right. God is not looking for fair weather Christians. Uh -huh. he, he's not looking for people that are solar powered faith. That solar powered faith means you only can praise him when the sun is shining. But God needs you to praise him when the sun is not shining in the middle of the night season. Yes. I'm trying to help somebody. I remember growing up in Chicago and my late grandfather, Reverend Joseph Allen, now takes the long sleep. And I noticed that when he went through storms, when he was going through persecution, that's when he sung the loudest. That's when he praised God the loudest. In, in other words, he said, I, I know I'm going through, but hallelujah. Anyhow. I'm looking for some hallelujah anyhow, folk. I told you about the lady who was at the church, and she kept on jumping and shouting. And the, and the pastor said, if you could just not shout for three Sundays, if you could just hold your peace just for three Sundays, we got this fine garment that was been knitted. We'll give it to you the next Sunday. Before we get up, she started jumping and shouting. She said, Pastor, sometimes you just got to say hallelujah anyhow. And so he gets to verse 12 and he says, why think it's strange that this is happening to you concerning the fiery trial that you got. Now, when he says fiery trial, uh, some scholars says perhaps he's talking to the burning down of Rome that Nero had burned. That this, but, but I believe and theologians agree that he's not talking about the burning down of, of Rome. He's talking about the fiery trials that when God takes you through the fiery trials, he's trying to purify you. 
And I've told you before, you don't make me tell the whole thing. Okay, I will. Well, you know, when the gold refiner has a piece of gold, it doesn't look like it does when you buy it at the store. It's ugly. It's, it, it has moss and, and it's, it has impurities in it. It's dirty. And the gold refiner takes the gold and he has tongs and he places it in that fiery furnace and he keeps taking it out, looking at it, puts it back in, takes it out, puts it back in, takes it out, looks at it, puts it back in. He said, now how many times is he going to keep taking that gold out of the fire? Putting it in the fire, taking it out of the fire, looking at it, putting it. He takes it out and he puts it back in and he keeps looking at it until he can see his reflection in the gold. Come here, I'm trying to help you. God is putting you in the fire, taking you out of the fire. He's putting you in the fire and he's looking at you. He puts you back in. He's looking for his reflection in you. He's looking to see if you can walk like him, talk like him, if you can behave like him, love like him. If you're going through the fire, thank God that he's trying to purify you to bring something out of you. Yes, yes. That's how, and I've said it before, Christians and tea bags are alike. In order for God to get the flavor out of you, you've got to go through some hot water. As a matter of fact, go on and look at your neighbor and say, that's why I got so much flavor. Because when I went through the water, he was with me. When I went through the fire, he was with me. I wasn't by myself. I've gone through something. As a matter of fact, I don't even look like what I've been through. And the reason I've got flavor... That I've gone through something. Anybody gone through something? Go on and give your neighbor a high five and say, if you ain't been through something, keep on living. Because the more you let your light shine for Christ, the bigger target you become for the enemy. I said something profound right there. And I don't want you to miss that. The more you let your light shine for Christ, the bigger target you become for the enemy the greater the anointing the greater the affliction I'm going to say that one more time the greater the anointing the greater the affliction he says why I think this is strange why me why do I have to go through this fiery trial as though some strange thing has happened to you And then he says, but rejoice. That's what our Dr. Gardner Taylor, the late Gardner Taylor called the oxymoron of the kingdom. The oxymoron. You're going to suffer, but rejoice. Amen. You're going through hard times. Be of good cheer. It's a strange phenomenon. To go through suffering and to be joyful? Three things this text teaches us. I'm going to give them to you. Give you three points, maybe four. Then I'll sit down and shout my own self happy. The first thing the text is tailored to, to teach us is don't think God is picking on you. Don't, don't think that you are some special person That God is just messing with you. There's nothing unusual about a Christian suffering. Some of the best Christians suffer. And I'm concerned if you have no trouble from the enemy. Because if you don't have no trouble from the enemy, it's a pretty good sign. That you and him are on the same team. Because if you're not walking with the enemy, you'll bump into him every now and then. Amos 3 and 3 says, how how can two walk together except they agree? If you're going to walk this Christian race, if you're going to live for Christ, if you're going to make some decisions from Christ, you're going to run into the enemy. Don't think God is picking on you. Number two, rejoicing is a requirement of the partnership. Rejoicing is a requirement. What, 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 what 
points at up there? It's, it's a, there we go. Come on with me. Paul Brand is a missionary, uh, surgeon in India who wrote The Gift of Pain. The Gift of Pain. He said pain and pleasure are not disconnected. But they, they come together like Siamese twins. He says, nearly all of my acute memories of happiness, there's some pain somewhere around the surface. I've never heard anyone say the deepest and rarest and most satisfying joys of my life have come of times of extended ease and earthly comfort. Nobody says that. What is true is what Samuel Rutherford said when, he said when he was put in the cellars of affliction. The great king keeps his wine there, not in the courtyard where the sun shines. What's true is what Charles Spurgeon said, they who dive in the sea of affliction bring up rare pearls. Did you hear that? That, that in order for God to bless you sometime, he's got to break you. In order for him to, to, to bless you, you've got to go through something. And be careful when you look at somebody and say, I want that anointing. You don't know what that person went through. You, you don't know what affliction that person, you don't know what trials and tribulation that, you, that that person went through. You just say, Lord, give me the strength to go through what I've got to go through. Third thing this text teaches us, I'm about through here, is undeserved suffering is redemptive. No cross, that's easy as it sounds. No crown. No, 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 no cross to bear, no crown to wear. And the inconvenience of the cross does not outweigh the investment of the crown. I said something profound, I'm going to say it one more time. The inconvenience of the cross does not outweigh the investment of of the crown. Why do we suffer? God permits it for reasons. Every, every religion says they have a reason. From paper cuts to mosquito bites to deep sickness, everyone has their own belief. Hinduism, suffering is seen as a result of karmic debt owed from a prior incarnation. Buddhists believe that they suffer in life because of their desires that can be relieved by good meditation and prayers. Judaism, suffering is seen as everything from senseless positively by will by God as a result of Jewish disobedience. Islam, suffering is seen as a result of Allah's positive will. For some brands of Protestantism, suffering is always a result of personal sins. But as Christians, we believe that there are two types of suffering. Redemptive suffering and wasted suffering. We, we, we believe that when we preach, preach, man, it, is, it has some kind of qualitative purpose and that God is trying to get some glory out of you. Why preach this? Because whether you want to hear it or not, and it may not make you shout, but we all need some stress in our lives. John Ortberg says too much comfort is dangerous. I'm talking to somebody this morning. I'm, I'm about done here. Every Baptist preacher says that at least three times. I'm saying that because somebody here, your national anthem is trouble in my way. Uh -huh. Your national anthem is nobody knows the trouble I see. Story is told of the preacher that was going through the furniture store. And, and the guy, the owner, took him to a big piece of wood that was crafted out to be a sideboard. And he showed him the intricate details of that wood and how the fabric of it was woven so tightly together. And he says, you can't get wood like this from just any place. He said, this wood comes from a part of the forest that is exposed to wind and danger. And the elements of that atmosphere was hard and rough on the outside and the surface of the tree. But we see here as a result of what the tree has been through, what it looks like on the inside. Come here. I'm talking to somebody that's going through the storms and the rains right now. 
that God is working on you. He's, he's making a better you. you. You'll be like that tree that's planted by the rivers of the water. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. For his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree. Yes. Yeah. that's planted by the rivers of the water yeah. that when the wind comes you'll be like the matrix you'll be blown but you won't be uprooted I need about 15 folk don't find standing on your feet and say Lord plant me like a tree sit down you're making me nervous here's the question for real for real how do you handle life when you love the Lord and yet he allows you to suffer? How do you avoid the why me syndrome? How, how do you do that? How do you do that? Number one, you got to remember what's to come is better than what's been. To tell somebody, encourage somebody and say what's to come is better than what's, what's been. Romans 8 and 17 says that if we are children, then as, as of God, if so that we suffer in him, that we will be glorified. Yes. With him. 18 verse says, Consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. It may look bad, but I know that one of these old days, one of these old days, I'll be, under, I'll be able to understand why I went through what I went through. I'll be understand why I had to go through what I, what, what I went through. I'll be, under, I'll be able to understand why folk treated me the way they treated me. One day my soul will look back and wonder how I got over. What's to come is better than what's been. Yes. Number two, I'm going to tell you, remember there's purpose for your pain. There is purpose for your pain. Don't see your pain or suffering through the lenses of isolation. Nobody but me. Victimization, Lord, you picking on me. Or paralyzation, I can't do nothing because the Lord won't let me move. I'm stuck. I'm in a rut. I'm, I'm caught off God. Don't, don't get caught in the why me syndrome. James 1 and 2 says, brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, yes. that the trying of your faith is working patience. That's another juxtaposition of the kingdom. Count it all joy when you fall into, tempt into trials and tribulations. When you're going through the storms of life, learn how to say hallelujah anyhow. Then I'm gone when I tell you, remember God uses our weakness yes. to prove his strength. God uses our weakness to prove his strength. Come here, Paul. Paul says, Lord, I got this thorn in my flesh. I'm suffering. And I don't want to be this way. And theologians and scholars have tried to figure out what the thorn was. Catholicism says it's some repressed sexual sin. Uh, Luther says that it, perhaps it was his eyesight. There were some scholars that said that Paul suffered ep epilepsy as a result of being struck down on the Damascus Road. At Can I tell you, we don't know what Paul's thorn is. And I'm glad we don't know. Because you glad don't nobody know what your thorn is. We all got some thorns in here. Check one, two. I said we all got some thorns in here. You don't know my thorn and I don't know your thorn. But we've got some thorns. Paul went to the Lord and said, Lord, please remove it. He went three times. Lord, remove this thorn. And the Lord's response was, I will not remove the thorn. But my grace. My grace is sufficient that in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. God's grace meets you right where you're at. It gives you what you do not have and it takes you where you'll never go. I need some grace cases that are here because of the grace of God. One more time, wave those chocolate and vanilla hands and say, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. We're standing. I can go to Calvary right from here because God he still can make straight lines with crooked sticks. 
He can draw straight lines with crooked sticks. Although the path may seem like you're going up and down and in and out because the trials of life, when it's all over, we'll see the path was straight and headed for the right direction. Beethoven composed his ninth symphony, Death. Van Gogh painted masterpieces while deeply depressed, contemplating suicide. And many people with disabilities like Helen Keller led remarkably productive lives despite their physical limitation. Because God can indeed draw a straight line with a crooked stick. And by virtue of that statement, he proves it through the writer of this epistle, Peter. Peter was loud, rambunctious, But he came to Christ and he acts so much like Christ that after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, they said, we're going to kill you, Peter. And we're going to kill you the same way we killed Jesus Christ. Peter says, I'm not worthy to die the same way. Oh, I'm willing to die. But if you're going to crucify me, Crucify me upside down. Because undeserved suffering is redemptive. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. Perhaps I'm talking to myself. But I just believe that that there's someone in here that God wants to help. To let you know that you're not in this thing alone. And that the darkest hour is just before the light. Weeping. May endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. We know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, to them that are called according to his purpose. Trust in the Lord with all of thine heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He will direct that path. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. I will bless the Lord. At all times. And his praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein for he is established upon the seas and upon the who shall ascend into the hills of the Lord he that has a clean hand and a pure heart he that has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully this is the generation of them that seek him that seek thy face O Jacob lift up your heads O ye gates and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord. Strong. Mighty in battle. The Lord powerful. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. If you're here today, standing with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you're saying, Reverend, that's me. I'm going through a storm right now. And I just need somebody to pray with me. And if that description fits you, just ease your hand up. I see some in the middle. 
And there'll be deacons, deaconess, and ministers walking the aisle to pray with you. On the other hand, you're saying, I want to become a member of Calvary. I know that if it's right to be in church, it's wrong to be out of church. If that description fits you, just slip your hand up. Church, we should be praying. Jesus Falling in love When Jesus Falling in love When Jesus That's the best thing I ever Ever done Oh, falling in love with Jesus, falling in love with Jesus, oh, falling in love with Jesus. In his arms, I feel protected. In his arms, never, never rejected. No. In his arms, I feel protected. And there's no place I rather be say it falling in love with Jesus falling in love with Jesus falling in love ever done in his hand there's so so much power in his hands I'm protected every hour yeah in his hands there is so much power and he's got all power in, in his hand you may be seated say that again together look at somebody and say it's offering time come on we can do better than that it's offering time all right we're standing all over the sanctuary as our ushers make ready uh, to give us leadership during the offertory period 
Uh, we have a mantra that we recite here at Calvary. And I would that everyone would stand if you can. And please uh, walk around, even if you've given through Giblified, so that we won't create a traffic jam in your aisle. Come on, Calvary, let's read our mantra. Take it down just a little bit. Just a little bit. We ready, set, read. Calvary members are tithing members. I will pay my tithes today. The tithe is the debt I owe. The offering is the seed I sow. The seed in my hand is my investment for future generations to evangelize the world. My giving makes a difference. Amen and amen. Please follow the direction of our illustrious ushers. Put your hands together for the people that serve us, our ushers, deacon and deaconess ministries. Let's receive our announcements. Good afternoon, Calvary. Listen up. The light of the Lord will always shine on you and his warmth shall be a comfort to you. Is this your birthday month? Please stand up and allow your Calvary Baptist family and friends to celebrate you on another trip around the sun. <laughs> Calvary family, Maya Angela wrote, in all the world, there is no heart for me like yours. In all the world, there is no love for you like mine. So if this is your anniversary month, rise to your feet and allow your Calvary Baptist family and friends to celebrate you.
Good afternoon, Calvary. It is time for your Calvary news. Hey, Calvary. It's time for your annual IGBC golf tournament fundraiser. Saturday, June 24th, 2023 at 8 a.m. will take place at Schneider's Riverside Golf Course, located at 5460 South Weber Drive in Riverdale, Utah. The registration deadline is Tuesday, June 6th, 2023. The entry fee for individual is $80 and for a team, $320. For more information, contact Deacon Dale Griffin at 801-564-0922 or Deacon Greg Lane at 801-815-4761. God bless and thank you. Hey, Calvary, we want to show off our amazing Calvary family, the beloved community. So please share your Calvary experience photos at calvarysoc.photos at gmail.com so we can praise our God in full view. Thank you, and please share your Calvary experience. God bless. Listen up, everybody. Calvary has a career job opening available immediately for church administrator. Do you want to work with some of the coolest and nicest people around, like Pastor Moses and Brother Robertson? Are you qualified? Do you have excellent credentials and experience? Do you have the heart for serving people and helping them to be successful? Do you get excited over completing small and large tasks? Are you a stickler? perfectionist for details? Do you thrive on multitasking and different daily challenges? If so, then this one is for you. Please view the full job description on our digital platforms, including our website, and apply. Copies of the church administrator description are also available at our front desk. Thank you, God bless, and we look forward to your applications. To all our 2023 graduates, Take pride in how far you've come and have faith in how far you can go. If you're graduating from kindergarten, elementary, middle, senior high school, trade school, or college, the Calvary Baptist Church community wants to celebrate your accomplishments. The Calvary Baptist Church Christian Education Department is planning an in-person celebration to be held on June 11, 2023 at 11 a.m., but we can't do it without you. If you would like to participate, please submit a picture with the completed registration information below. Name, parent's name, grade level you are graduating from, email or cell phone number, and if you're a senior and graduating from high school, what are your plans for next year? If you're graduating from trade school or college at any level, what are your plans and what certificates or degrees did you earn and in what subject? Please submit your information to Sister Kathleen Christie at k.christie at hotmail.com with the graduation in the subject line, or you can email your information to christianeducation at calvarysoc.com. BPOU, Black Physicians of Utah presents Intensive Outpatient Clinic. The Innovation of Integrated Care, Wednesday, June 7th, 2023, from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at Marmalade Branch Library, 280 West, 500 North, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84103. Topics of discussion will be, what is population health and effective models of community health? Speakers will include Dr. Erica Baden, Dr. Richard Ferguson, and Dr. Stacy Bank. All are invited to attend please scan the QR code to RSVP. More information can be found on all Calvary social media platforms and at the front desk. Calling all high school students. Join the Huntsman Cancer Institute this summer from June 10th to August 12th at Calvary Baptist Church to learn more about the careers in science, technology, engineering, math, STEM, medicine, and more. The program will be held every Saturday for four hours. Participating students will receive an $800 stipend for attending all sessions. You heard that right, $800.
Register before June 10th. For more information, visit Calvary's website, Facebook, and Instagram, or pick up a flyer from the front desk. Thank you. Hey, Calvary, the Kingdom Church of God in Christ will be celebrating its 71st church anniversary and revival, June 7th through 9th, 2023, at 7 p.m. The church anniversary service will be Sunday, June 11th, 2023, at 3.30 p.m. Guest speaker will be Evangelist Elder Dwayne Snell. Services will take place at the DAV Center, 273 East, 800 South, Salt Lake City, Utah, all are welcome. Emory Chapel will be celebrating its 115th church anniversary and revival. Revival services will be June 8th through 9th, 2023 at 7 p.m. Church anniversary will be June 11th, 2023 at 3.30 p.m. Guest speaker will be Emeritus Pastor France A. Davis. Services will take place at Emory Chapel, 264 30th Street in Ogden, Utah. Please come and join us. Pastor Oscar T. Moses, invited guest speaker and Calvary Baptist Church, will be the special guest of Pastor Merrill's and Baseline Christian Fellowship Baptist Church as they celebrate their pastor's first anniversary and their church's first anniversary on Sunday, June 4th, 2023 at 3.30 p.m. Pastor is asking all leadership, congregation, and ministries to support and be present to share in this celebration. Baseline Christian Fellowship is located at 460 South, 800 East, Salt Lake City, Utah. See you all there. I got joy in my soul. God is in control. I got Satan on my trail, but I'm singing all is well. He's attacking every day, but I'm watching while I pray. Hey, Calvary War, W-A-R, God's Word Applied Rightly, is on high eaters. It is time for summer break, and we will be back in August. There will be teachings by Pastor Moses, Q&A, small groups, and of course, contact Sister Kathy Christie at... Christian Education at CalvarySLC.com or call 801-550-7396. And that concludes Calvary News. And remember, if you ever miss or want to revisit any sermons or announcements, you can visit us at Calvary's YouTube channel or CalvarySLC.com. Dot com, as well as Facebook and Instagram. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for being here. God bless, and we look forward to seeing you next time. We're standing, getting ready to go home now. Um, once again, I want to wish uh, Lady Willene Davis a very happy birthday. And once again, I want to thank God for our mayor, Mayor Aaron Mendenhall, for honoring us with her presence on today. Look at somebody and say, I love you. There's nothing you can do about it, but love me back. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to smile upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we could ask or think according to the power that worketh through us. Be glory in the church, both now and forever, world without end. And all of those who love the Lord said, amen. amen. They said, amen again. Amen. Now come on, throw both hands, head back, say it like you really mean it. Hold it right there. After we forgot to do the, uh, the great commission of the church, so we're going to leave on that. Ready, set, read. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, 
even unto the end of the world. Amen. Have a great week. Don't eat too much. Don't drink too much. Have a great time. <laughs>